We are now at part three of lecture 13 of Applied Machine Learning, in which we talk about boosting. In this video, I would like to talk about yet another kind of boosting algorithm called gradient boosting. And gradient boosting is going to be the most powerful of the boosting algorithms that we have seen so far. And this is actually going to be an algorithm that attains state-of-the-art performance on many important machine learning problems. And in fact, gradient boosting algorithms are some of the most successful uh, algorithms on competitions like Kaggle, uh, meaning that they tend to be used in the largest number of winning results on Kaggle. So uh, uh, gradient boosting really uh, achieves state-of-the-art performance on many, <clears throat> many important problems and uh, we're going to look at them in this video. <clears throat> so recall that uh, boosting is a way of combining multiple smaller weak learners, multiple small models into a bigger model by training them in a way that um, corrects the errors of the submodels. So these are weak models, but we fit them on the points where the previous models have made errors. And so the resulting ensemble of all of these models will be accurate given enough predictors. And we can see that uh, these um, that we can we can see boosting as fitting um, what is called an additive model. So an additive model consists of a main ensemble model and t smaller submodels that each have weights alpha and parameters phi. <clears throat> the the, the total set of parameters uh, of the full model are the alpha and all of the phi. Uh, and it is, um, it is a model that is, we use the term additive, but not linear, because it is not linear in the parameters uh, anymore. This can be highly nonlinear, because the, the g itself can be nonlinear in the phi. And a general way of fitting these kinds of models is the forward stage-wise approach, where we have a loss, and initially we just minimize this loss, but then at the next iteration, we look at all the uh, additive components that we have so far, uh, we put them here, and we, fit, we freeze their parameters, and we only uh, learn the parameters of the new model, <clears throat> which comes here uh, as, a, as, the, as, our, uh, as, as the next additive, as the teeth additive term. It comes here, and, uh, and we only optimize over this part, we keep this part fix, fixed, and this keeps the optimization problem tractable. And then as we saw earlier, we can fit many kinds of losses using this approach. If we use the exponential loss, we have an algorithm called Adaboost. If we use the L2 loss, then we can solve this for regression, and there are many other losses as well. <clears throat> but this approach is also not without limitations. One issue is that um, for example, in the case of Adaboost or L2 Boost or uh, Logit Boost, we derived um, um, manual update rules by hand for what alpha can be or for the way, for what the weights can be. Now, of course, we may not need to have manual. Uh, we we may not need to have a formula for the alphas and the Ws, but having a formula simplifies uh, analysis and makes the algorithms faster. But of course. Defining these new update rules for each new kind of loss is, uh, is laborious and may not always be possible. Um, also, we still have to solve an optimization problem at every step phi. Uh, but if we solve this optimization um, maximally, uh, if we solve this optimization exactly, if we find the best phi, then this approach may be a little bit greedy. By this, I mean that we are trying to optimize, uh, we're trying to reduce our, our loss here in this optimization problem by as much as possible at every step. And it's possible that we are going to overfit at some step by, uh, by if, we use our if we use a model G that is too flexible. So we would like to look at ways of addressing these limitations so we would like to have an algorithm that works with uh, many different losses in a very general way and that, that is still easy to train. 
and that also uh, can be controlled for overfitting more effectively. And the resulting algorithm is going to be called gradient boosting. Before I define gradient boosting, I'm going to talk to you about functional optimization, and we'll see that gradient boosting is, uh, is, a, is an instance of this principle called functional optimization. So in functional optimization, the idea is that instead of optimizing over a model, we're going to consider the problem of optimizing the loss over an arbitrary set of functions uh, that go from x to y. So before we would be optimizing the parameters of some kind of model, but let's just, as an intellectual exercise, look at what would happen if we were to optimize over a general model over a general function, over, over the space of functions directly. <clears throat> so one immediate observation is that we only have n data points. And so we only have n degrees of freedom. And even though we have an infinite number of functions, we, we, have, a, we have a very large space of functions. They, for the purposes of fitting our training set, they only are defined by their values at n data points. And so we are essentially optimizing, uh, essentially, um, a large set of functions are all going to be equivalent if they output the same predictions on the training set. And we can summarize all of these functions by a single vector, which I'm denoting here by boldface f, uh, which lives in Rn, where n is our number of data points. So again, optimizing over the entire space of function is equivalent to optimizing over these kinds of vectors, because we only have n data points over which we can optimize. And the resulting optimization problem has this form. So we are looking for, uh, we're optimizing over the space of f's. Uh, and uh, so this is the value of a function at this, <clears throat> at, this, um, at this point. And we're minimizing the loss with the y. And uh, if we find a good f, then all the functions that have this, that, that attain this set of value that attain this set of values at the training set, those are good functions. So, so far, it's, this is more of an intellectual exercise. And let's continue this intellectual exercise further. Uh, think of it as a thought experiment. Imagine that we would be, that we would optimize this expression using gradient descent. If we wanted to optimize this using gradient descent, well, we need some notion of gradient. And uh, this notion of gradient that we're going to use will be called the functional gradient, which is the gradient of this expression here, uh, relative to the vector of points that are, um, uh, the, relative to the vector f that uh, defines our, um, our function. Each component of this vector is simply the, the partial derivative of this expression with respect to uh, the parameter here f sub i. <clears throat> so here, for example, f2, only the second term depends on f2. So therefore, we have only the second term here in the numerator, and we're taking its derivative <clears throat> with respect to f2 in this second component of the gradient. Um, and this defines here a valid gradient for, uh, for this loss. Um, if we have this gradient, then we could minimize our function earlier by applying the following update, which is simply gradient descent with a step size of alpha. Now, um, these are all definitions that we're going to be using in a moment. But of course, the algorithm that I'm proposing here is not really practical. As I said earlier, it's a thought experiment. Um, first of all, it is really easy to optimize this objective because it's unconstrained. We can choose any value for f. In fact, we could just set f to our uh, vector y and uh, not even perform gradient descent, uh, which is why I'm saying this is a thought exercise. But even if we did use this gradient descent algorithm, we would trivially arrive to the, um, to, 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 to the minimum because we just have a simple unconstrained optimization problem. For, for most reasonable losses L that we would use. Um, but uh, also the problem is that 
if we solve this optimization problem exactly, we will be fitting the training data really well, but this function that we're going to learn will not generalize. So we can learn um, uh, a set of values for f that will be accurate on our training set, but not all of the functions that achieve this, uh, this vector f are going to generalize. And what we really want is we want to find a function that achieves a small value of our objective, that, it, that has a good fit, that is measured by our objective function j here. It achieves a good fit at any n points that we might sample from the, from the distribution. So given um, we want to perform some optimization procedure uh, such that this, um, this, this, this resulting function, if I ev evaluate it at any other set of n training points, it will be accurate. So how would we do this? Well, we're going to do this by l learning a model of gradients. So let's dissect what this means. In supervised learning, we started with the concept of a model for the function f that lives in some kind of class, which we denoted by script m. And the idea is that we're going to learn a model that achieves uh, a good prediction on our training set, but also it will generalize. And we will on purpose choose uh, a class of a class m here that doesn't contain all the functions so if m is too large we will overfit so we constrain m on purpose either directly or via a regularizer and this prevents us from overfitting so for example we would choose a linear model instead of a instead of an arbitrary degree polynomial so that we can generalize outside the training set and so um, even though there is an arbitrary function that we could learn, <clears throat> that, that we could that we could learn, um, and that would take our value of f here, we're going to assume a model for f that will be restricted. It will not be perfect. It will not achieve the minimum possible value here of uh, that this function f could uh, could achieve if we were to directly optimize over the smallest f but as a result, it will generalize. So the idea of <clears throat> uh, approximating gradients is that we apply the same idea to the gradient of the, <clears throat> of the objective function. So we want to, again, perform functional gradient descent, but we only have uh, n training points. And instead of just directly minimizing uh, over these uh, training points, we are going to uh, assume um, that the gradient has some kind of functional form that is, that is defined by a model. And then <clears throat> instead of adding um, this arbitrary value of the gradient, which is unconstrained, we're going to instead replace this with a surrogate model, which will be constrained <clears throat> and then if we perform gradient descent, if we perform many steps of gradient descent, we will not minimize our function directly, but we will have um, a function which approximates the, the, um, the uh, which, which generalizes well beyond the training set. So again, we assume some kind of model for what this gradient is and we use it to approximate this uh, functional gradient term. And then if we look at our gradient descent update and we, we replace this um, functional gradient with an approximate model of this gradient that we're gonna learn from data, then we have the following fu uh, formula for functional gradient descent. So here uh, at each step, I am taking whatever function um, I currently have, whatever estimate of the minimizing function I have, then I estimate its gradient from data, <clears throat> and this gives me another function g, 
<clears throat> that at each point will evaluate to the gradient, uh, it will evaluate to the partial derivative of uh, that, that I want for each value of x. And then I simply add it to my old function, and this gives me a new function uh, that is the previous one minus this step of functional gradient descent. So let's now define this a little bit more precisely. So I, 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 uh, I, vaguely, I vaguely mentioned that we can approximate this general functional gradient with a function g, but what does that really mean? What does it really mean in practice? So in order to do this, we are going to uh, resort, in order to perform this approximation, we are going to resort to standard supervised learning. So imagine that we have some function f. Uh, again, we are optimizing over the space of functions, and we are at some point in our optimization process, which is some function, some guess for the, the best model. <clears throat> and we want to uh, improve this further by a little bit. So we, uh, in, in order to uh, improve this function, we want to take a gradient step uh, on f. And so we need to estimate its functional uh, gradient. This notation here, uh, it shows the derivative of the loss uh, with respect to its parameter uh, f, which is our estimate of y, evaluated at the value f of x. So if I wanted to take the function at the point f of x and change the value at f of x in order to minimize this loss, then I would follow this, uh, this derivative. And this is evaluated at f of x, and we can, evaluate it, we can evaluate it at every possible point x. And if I were to take a step along all of these points, then I would be minimizing the value of my loss. So this is, uh, and also this is the value uh, that was in our uh, in our vector here uh, when we set f to be uh, f of x1 and uh, the second component was this expression where we used f of x2, etc. Um, and this notation bar and evaluated, this is a standard notation is calculus, in calculus which says that we evaluate this expression at this particular uh, value. So how can we uh, create a gradient um, oh, and by the way, I should mention that as a function of x, this is a well-defined function. So for each value of x, I can evaluate this expression, and this gives me, this gives me a well-defined function uh, that is the functional gradient of f at every possible point. He, uh, and in fact, if we instantiate, if we, look, if we consider this function at our set of training points, then we have uh, this uh, vector that I have defined earlier, but in principle, as a function of x, this can be a general function that we can evaluate at any point. And therefore, uh, ah, and also as a function, it's a function from the spaces of x's to the real numbers, because this is going to be just uh, a, um, a real valued number. Um, so this is a function from x to the reals, and it's a function that we can try to estimate from data. Uh, and we can estimate it using supervised learning. If we want to apply supervised learning to estimating this problem, well, um, recall that uh, our recipe for applying supervised learning is a model class. So we're going to assume that G uh, is within some model class. This can be a decision tree or some other type of model. And uh, we also need to define an objective. So we assume that we have some notion of loss uh, that measures how well this approximation holds. And this can be, for example, the L2 loss. In fact, the L2 loss is, 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 a loss that, is a loss that is used in practice for this often. And now we need to define a training data set for, um, uh, in order to apply, well, uh, so we have a loss and we also have an algorithm for minimizing this loss. So we can use decision trees to minimize this L2 loss. And so this defines our supervised learning algorithm. And now in order to apply supervised learning, we also need to define a data set 
uh, on which we're going to fit this function. And this data set is defined here. I am using the, the same notation that I kept using, that I have been using before for a supervised learning data set. Uh, and here I'm denoting this um, data set for the gradient as script D sub G. And it consists of a set of N training instances uh, where each training instance here is within is within um, the um, the parentheses and I have n of them they're indexed by i this training uh, this training instance it has an input uh, which is our input x and it also has a target which is here and uh, the, the inputs are simply the inputs of the vectors of attributes that we have as part of our training set. And now at each point in the training set, we can estimate, we can compute, and we can use as a, as a target our estimate of the functional derivative. Recall, uh, as I said, this expression, uh, we can, it, um, uh, it, it is a, f a function of, um, of um, uh, of x, so we can evaluate it at each point in our training set, and now we can try to predict it using supervised learning, and for a suitable choice of model g, we are going to be predicting this value uh, in a way that will be accurate on our training set, or sufficiently accurate in our training set, and that will generalize. So essentially this forms a valid supervised learning problem where we are fitting a model g that will approximate the components of this vector. Um, again, here, each value uh, that we have here, each, each value that we have here, this functional derivative uh, at this point, that is simply the ith component of this vector. So we are, again, trying to approximate this functional vector via a function g, such that if we evaluate g at xi, we're going to get the ith derivative with the ith component of this vector, which is simply this expression here. And then if we evaluate it outside our training set, if we choose our model class correctly such that it generalizes, then we will also get estimates of this gradient, accurate estimates of this gradient at points outside the uh, training region, um, and therefore we will generalize. So again, here we train a model on this data set, and now if I if I evaluate this model at some new point x, then the output will approximate the functional derivative at, uh, at a point f of x, which we may have not seen before. So in this, in, in this sense, the function g of x that we will have learned is going to be an approximation to the true functional gradient. So this uh, what I what I defined so far has been an approximation procedure to learn an approximate model of a gradient. Next, uh, let's now, uh, given a model of a gradient, we can now plug in this model in our definition of gradient descent and perform gradient descent in functional space with, uh, we can perform functional gradient descent using our estimate of the, uh, using our model which estimates the true gradient in functional space. And when we perform this uh, procedure, uh, this, when we perform this, this procedure, this is, uh, this gives us an algorithm, this gives us a valid machine learning algorithm, which is called gradient boosting. So gradient boosting is functional gradient descent with approximate gradients that we learn at each step of gradient descent. Let's, uh, let's, let, let's define gradient boosting here. So in gradient boosting, as in general boosting, we start with an empty ensemble, and then over the course of multiple steps that are indexed by t, we perform the following. First, we form this training data set that I defined on the earlier slide, and we fit a model of the gradient at this function f, which is defined here, uh, using our loss. And you can think of this loss as being the L2 loss that's often used in practice. So we have, we're, we're fitting this gradient 
uh, using this uh, using this function, and then we perform a step of gradient descent in functional space. So we uh, update our current uh, ensemble, which is also an additive model, by adding to it this additional term, which is our gradient plus some uh, uh, that, that is that is multiplied by uh, a parameter alpha, which can be as, seen as a step size, and this can vary or it can stay uh, the same over the course of gradient descent. So these two steps define what what is uh, define the gradient boosting algorithm. Here in step one, uh, in step one we run the process that I showed in the earlier slide, and this gives this gives us a model G, and then we simply update our model F by setting it to be the previous instance of the model with this additional term added in. So this summarizes the gradient boosting approach. And after we have run this for a number of steps t, we are going to get a model that has this form, which is simply an additive model uh, and it looks exactly like the output of a boosting algorithm. So this is why gradient boosting is also called boosting. It's a it's a it's a principled way of doing uh, of, of fitting uh, an additive model, and it also happens to correspond to uh, uh, to, to to boosting. Uh, and the advantage well, f first of all, uh, if we were to apply gradient, if we were to instantiate gradient boosting with either the exponential loss or the uh, or the L2 loss, we would recover our earlier uh, L2 boost or eta boost algorithms, except maybe we would choose a different uh, set of weights alpha. But uh, otherwise, we can recover uh, our earlier algorithms as special cases of gradient boosting. Uh, but also, gradient boosting can work without any modification for any differentiable loss uh, and we don't require any derivations on top of this loss. Now, what kind of interesting losses can we use? Um, green boosting works equally well for regression and classification. For regression, we could use the L2 loss, which we have seen before, but now we can also easily plug in the L1 loss. We could use something else, something called the Huber loss, which I haven't uh, really talked about, but it's uh, essentially an interpolation between L1 and L2. And we can even train various uh, probabilistic type of losses. Um, there exists a loss, uh, which again, I, I'm not defining it here, but um, uh, uh, it is called the quantile loss. And the quantile loss estimates some kind of quantile of the distribution. So the, the 50th quantile is the median, the 75th quantile is the value such that the data lies below this quantile 75% uh, of the time. And so the quantile loss now estimates properties of the distribution of y given x and we can use it to form prediction to to to, to output prediction intervals in addition to just single uh, outputs for um, for gradient boosting uh, for um, for y using gradient boosting and we can also use classification losses some of the some of these we've seen before log loss exponential they're also uh, there are also times when we want to model certain discrete counts, like for example, if a person comes to a store and, or if, if a number of individuals come into a store to buy a certain item, uh, then we can model this process using something called the negative binomial distribution, and this defines its own loss, uh, so we can apply green boosting on top of that. Um, and my point here is that any differentiable loss works. And uh, in practice, if we when we use gradient boosting, we uh, there also there are again a few practical considerations that are worth keeping in mind. Um, I haven't mentioned yet what the base learners are, but uh, in most applications of gradient boosting, these are taken to be decision trees. The reason we have been using decision trees so far for uh, most applications of boosting is that they're easy to train and also they don't require a lot of pre-processing of the data and they work equally well for classification and regression. So uh, in some algorithms like neural networks 
it's important to consider the numerical properties of the input. It has to be properly scaled. Um, in certain algorithms, the input features must be uh, sufficiently uncorrelated. But here, with a gradient decision, uh, with a with a decision tree, we don't really need to worry about how the input looks like. We can just run it without many modifications. And that gives. And so, if we use decision trees as the base learners, all the boosting algorithms that we have seen so far, they inherit this property that they can work on various types of inputs without a lot of pre-processing. Now, within this algorithm, we can also uh, perform uh, regularization effectively. Um, one way in which we can do this is by controlling the tree size, but also we can do this by controlling the step size alpha. Um, so we don't need to... Uh, I mentioned earlier that a problem with the previous uh, approach is that we could fit the, we could be too greedy and we could optimize the model uh, to a degree that is, um, that, that would lead to overfitting at a, at a particular step. But here we can easily solve this problem by just taking smaller step sizes alpha. Uh, so this is, this corresponds to performing smaller steps of gradient descent and we can terminate, terminate this gradient descent uh, process early by using early stopping and monitoring our performance on a holdout data set. And finally, because this procedure has an interpretation of, uh, of gradient descent, we can apply certain standard tricks to accelerate this process and to scale it up to large data sets. Um, for example, instead of fitting the gradient on all of the data, we could subsample a portion of the data and only fit the gradient on that, um, on, on that data point. And that essentially corresponds to something which is called stochastic gradient descent, which you, uh, which, which, which you may have heard about. If not, it's not important. Uh, my point here is that we can also scale up this algorithms, uh, scale up this, al this gradient boosting algorithm to large data sets in a principled way by subsampling the data in certain ways. So here I'm summarizing uh, this algorithm, which is gradient boosting. It, uh, it works for both classification and regression. It can use ensembles of weak learners. Uh, it uses ensembles of weak learners as the model family. And these weak learners are often decision trees. Uh, and it can optimize any differentiable function using gradient descent. Let's now look at a small example of gradient boosting on a regression data set. Here, I'm going to uh, define the following um, regression problem where uh, there is a true function here, which is given by this expression, and uh, I'm sampling random points around this function, so this is a noisy function. Um, and I can train a gradient boosting regression easily using uh, the scikit-learn function. Here I just import, I instantiate, and, uh, and I fit this function. And now I can visualize its predictions uh, in, a, in a very convenient way. I, uh, I, I, can, I simply you know, run the, the prediction function and the output is this, um, is this red curve. And you can see that this red curve, actually it follows the data and uh, it has this, it's, it's not a smooth function because this is all made up of decision trees. So there, so th there is a decision tree which outputs a certain value in each interval here and um, and the gradient boosting algorithm simply combines a lot of them until in some places like this the kinks are so small that it looks smooth but essentially it's a it's a it's, it's this kind of step function and it's jagged because it, it it's a combination of decision trees uh, but these are still really accurate and even though we have this very nonlinear curve, we're still able to fit it really well without making any assumptions at all uh, on, on the shape of this data. So we did not assume any kind of polynomial, we did not assume any kind of uh, uh, kernel, uh, we, we, we just had some bounds on the number of decision trees that we had and uh, we used decision trees of a small depth. Um, so here, this was actually set when we defined the algorithm. Um, here we have decision trees of depth three, 
and we have 250 estimators. So this shows how easy it is to fit a complicated function using gradient boosted trees. And so I just want to summarize this uh, this this, um, this 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 part of the lecture by again reemphasizing that uh, gradient boosting algorithms are the most powerful form of boosting that um, that that we have, and it's also one of the most uh, one of the most powerful algorithms that we have in machine learning. And there are implementations that achieve state of the art performance on many problems. Uh, often outperforming other uh, popular approaches such as deep learning. Um, one interesting fact about gradient boosted trees is that they tend to, um, uh, they're probably the most performing model on Kaggle. Uh, they tend to win the most competitions. As I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons is that they require a lot, they require a little pre-processing and tuning, so they're not affected by uh, data processing problems, which makes it easier to uh, tune the actually important hyperparameters. And they also scale to, to really large data sets, and they can fit a lot of different objectives, which makes them really powerful. And if I were to highlight the limitations, I would say the main limitations of gradient boosted trees, the, the reason why it's not a universal off-the-shelf algorithm is that it, uh, it doesn't work with unstructured uh, inputs like images and audio uh, because it's, it's not really uh, since the base learner is a decision tree these don't really work on images or audio it's not really possible to define uh, to analyze an image via a decision tree by just looking at the shape of the pixels or at least it doesn't work well um, and also some of these implementations may not be as flexible as modern deep learning libraries but however, on inputs which correspond to a set of well-defined features, uh, like most of the examples we saw in, the, in this class, for example, the diabetes data set, where we have certain uh, features like measurements uh, about a patient or uh, the properties of a house or um, other well-defined features. In these kinds of regimes, green boosted trees are uh, state-of-the-art and uh, they're probably the first algorithm that you should try.